Hello and welcome to episode 12 of the Fantastically Terrible Podcast. Today is all about the whitewashing of history part one. From the fall of Troy to King Arthur. What do Greek mythology, the Bible, and Arthurian legends have in common? Black people? You win a cookie for that, because you're partly right. Major African characters that have been overlooked or completely erased. We're here to help set the record straight. There's a lot of information in this episode, so we actually had to split it into two parts. Next week, we'll cover African empires before colonization, including the richest man who ever lived, the Renaissance, and the Enlightenment. Today, you're going to begin with a story. So when I was 18, I used to make art for tombstones. Tombstone an, artist. Right. Sounds like a cool t-shirt. Actually, is. yeah. Keep that in mind. All right. Um, my boss was Greek, and he kept just bugging me to go to his church. Now, anybody who knows me, I'm not particularly religious, but I'm kind of open to anything. And I said, you know what, George? I'll go. Like a piece of granite, he wore you <laughs> he down. He wore me down. So I went. And it was wild because when I get there, the church is divided. The into, congregate, the people the con- there. Yeah, the po- mm-hmm. people, like, evenly divided. Like, one side is, like, all black. The other side's all white. And I'm, like, you know, African-American. I'm, like, what's going on Where here? Where do I sit? I'm, like, this is weird. And I thought this was Greek Orthodox. Mm-hmm. So I sat with my friend George on the Greek side. And I just couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> on the Greek side. All right, go ahead. And I'm staring over at the other side going, what is going on? Mm-hmm. Like, I was really, really curious. And the priest comes. Before he starts, he welcomes the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And I'm like, Orthodox Ethiopian Church? What is that? I was 18. I didn't know any better. Yeah, I didn't know squat. So let's tie your story mm-hmm. into our current subject for this episode. Okay. Which is... The whitewashing of mythology and history to remove African culture, African heritage from texts that we study all the time. Which is something more, I would say, more of a, compared to antiquity, more of a modern thing. The word cosmopolitan Mm -hmm. is an ancient Greek word. So this goes back, the idea of just having different peoples was not foreign to the ancient Greeks. Right, right. So for the Greeks, they wouldn't have done that. So we have to understand that that was erased more recently. Now, if you were to look at the map... Of the world. Of the world. Most people who live in the Americas sort of view in their minds Africa and Europe very separate from each other. Right. But if you look at where Spain is, like the very tip of it, the place where it's called the Pillars of Hercules, Mm -hmm. there's only eight miles... The Straits of of Gibraltar. Right. There's only eight miles of water Mm -hmm. between Spain and Africa. And, you know, you can extend that. Yes, that's a very close point. But even if you look at all of the Mediterranean... Look at ancient Greece. It's right there. So back to what you were just saying, of course they traded with Africa. Why not? Well, if you think of it's right there. And at that time, Africa had empires and had kingdoms, yeah. which now we don't really learn too much about other than Egypt. Mm-hmm. And they had very wealthy contending with or greater than the Europeans. Yep. And it's ridiculous to think a border stopped them. Of course, it didn't stop them. It was yeah. their neighbors. They traded north, south, east, and west. Right. And, and I think the other thing that has to be understood is that the Mediterranean, Middle Earth, mm-hmm. that's how it translates <laughs> to, is, uh, a, has been and will always be a melting pot. Completely, 100%. Yeah. Going from Western Europe to Italy, to Venice, to Asia was yeah. not a big deal. Not a big Distance deal. Distance-wise, yes, but they traded all the time. Right. It was not a big deal. And all of these major cities were cultural, culturally diverse. Mm-hmm. There's an irony that black people who feature prominently in Greek mythology were mm-hmm. removed. Her- Herodotus, another... Uh, uh, the, yeah, the, the father, father of, of his, modern history. <laughs> modern, modern history. He said that black people were the most beautiful and wisest people he ever met. And that falls just completely opposite to the ideas that we've been given. They are completely 
uneducated. They think what they see in art and movies and TV mm -hmm. means they were white, and if you make a character black, you're right. you're changing history. Right. And it's not that at all. I think that's part of it, but I think another part of it is is that most people think that Africa and Europe only started to meet each other in the 1600s. Oh, ridiculous. But yeah. I think that's the sort of mental setup. Yeah. And as you'll see, that's far from the truth. In preparation for the show, I was reading a little bit about how ancient Greek people used color. Mm -hmm. And apparently, color was not physically what you see. They mm -hmm. used color in more of an emotional way. Hmm. Because they wrote in... Po all of these things are poems, mm. right? They right. wrote in a poetic way. Right. And when they use color, like they'll describe Achille as black or um, red more than they do. Because a lot of people say, oh, they say he had blonde hair. But they translate it as blonde. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean blonde. Right. It could mean other things. Right. Uh, but they only mention that a few times in reference. I think two or three times. But they mention black or red many many times right it doesn't mean he was black or it doesn't mean he was blonde but if you're going to look at the number of times they right. use the word they use black or red more than they use blonde and you did mention and it means his anger his right. fighting his war so color was to evoke the emotion that he was a warrior right and you did mention to me the gods were also depicted with blue hair. Now, I we only associate so blue cool. hair with anime now. They used blue to describe the hair color of the gods, the Greek gods, and also humans. And we know humans don't have blue hair. Right. They also describe the ocean as being a dark wine color. That's true. I remember reading the Iliad and, and they say that, that was weird. many times. So color for the Greeks is not physical like it is for us. There are words you just can't translate. Yeah, that's right. Especially ancient Greek. Ancient Greek yeah. always has multiple. Try translating love from ancient Greek. You get three, four meanings in a modern English. <laughs> exactly. And you have to pick one. All of a sudden, uh, the Gilgo, the lady that plays uh, Wonder Woman, is going to play Cleopatra. And everybody's like, well, you know, she was Greek. And people have to understand that Greek is not a race. It's a nationality. Actually, I have a, a link to an article where they say, oh, the dynastic Egyptians were Greek. End mm. of story. We have DNA evidence. End of story. Yeah, but what does that mean? But if you read articles from... Yeah, they're uh, geneticists. If you look at geneticists, people who study these things, actual scientists, mm -hmm. they don't compare it to a diversification of African DNA. Right. And DNA is only as good as what you can compare it to. That's right. And if you don't have African DNA to compare it to, you will not find correlations to African right. DNA. And there's also, to the side where you can only really trace the father's, not much the mother's side, too. You need so more data. You need a lot but more But I'll, I'll have an article on that to see that DNA is not the end of the story it's for the, the dynastic period. Because if you add more data sets, mm -hmm. you will find that they were not... Well, just the, exclusively, those... and it's stupid to say they're Caucasian anyways. You cannot see race in DNA. <laughs> Africa has the broadest range yes. of DNA. The modern lens is skewed. Mm -hmm. If you go pre-slave trade, right. it was completely different. Right. And the empires were different, and the acknowledgement of empires was different. Right. So if we tie what you were saying back to Greek antiquity, okay, we'll go to the famous Trojan War. Right. Did you know that Africans took part in the Trojan War? As a matter of fact, I did. Would the average person? No. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because I went down that rabbit's hole when that's I was 18. Right, that's right. So they, they feature very prominently in the story of the Trojan War. And they're just completely omitted. You don't have to wonder, was this famous hero, what shade was he? It's all complexion, for goodness yeah. sakes. What shade was this or that? There were actually what the Greeks would call Ethiopians. Mm -hmm. What could be Ethiopian, perhaps yep. African. Uh, the word is a little bit ambiguous in the modern context. Greeks referred to Ethiopians as people who lived where the sun rises and sets. Mm -hmm. And they were supposedly beloved by the gods and were among the few people among whom the gods could walk openly. Mm. So high praise for the Ethiopians or Ethiopians, mm -hmm. which could refer to people of African origin, not sure. 
Yeah. But let's just stick with Ethiopian. Okay. In the Trojan Wars, mm -hmm. there was the famous, which should be famous to everybody, right up there with every other Greek hero, mm -hmm. Memnon, king of Ethiopia, mm -hmm. or we could say Ethiopia. And he was an ally of the Trojans. And King Priam himself called him to aid him during the war. And there's a huge part of the story where King Priam is worried and wringing his hands. Is he going to show up? We need this guy. Is he going to show up? And then he finally shows up and it's this big, huge celebration that, oh, thank God they came in. He had a huge army that they could not even number to aid the Trojans. Memnon was the son of Tithonos, who was a king in Ethiopia, and the goddess Eos. And it's interesting because Eo is dawn. Ah, and that's where the sun yeah. rises and yeah. sets. Another correlation there. Another correlation. Interesting. Yeah. And even his armor was forged by the god Hephaestus himself. Yeah. So this Mem Memnon was a huge hero in Greek mythology. Right. And you have to wonder, why don't we know about this more? Yeah. When they depict the Trojan War, why isn't he one of the great heroes? Well, what's interesting is that the... Uh, he even has an epic poem, Ethiopis, dedicated to him. Right. And, and, you know, it's interesting. When you dig, you'll find that the uh, Kushite, Kushite archers, which are Ethiopians, mm -hmm. were some of the best archers ever. They said they could hit you in the eye from, like, a, a mile away, all, all sorts of <laughs> crazy stories. They served in the Persian, Greek, and Roman army. Yeah, and they're just completely, completely, let's say, whitewashed out, erased. Erased. Like they never existed. Yeah. And in the Trojan War, he fought many, he killed many. Finally, there was a big confrontation with Achille, the great warrior who was destined to actually help the Greeks against the Trojans and win the war. Mm -hmm. And he, it was him that ended up killing Memnon. But Memnon's mother mm -hmm. begged Zeus to bring him back to life. Mm -hmm. And Zeus did bring him back to life and made him an immortal god. Wow. So not only was he a Greek hero, he's also a Greek god. Wow. Memnon's father, Tithonos, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was Priam's brother, Priam, king of Troy. Right. Father of Hector and Paris and all the other heroes. Right. Their cousin was Memnon. Mm -hmm. So, of course, he's not just calling the Ethiopians to help them. He's calling his, his brother and his nephew, come help us. We need you. Right. Which means you had mixed heritage families. Yeah, and it's it's something that when we think that... Greeks what, related to Africans, no problemo. And what's, what's crazy, it goes back to my story, right? Exactly. Walking in, and I'm like, what's going on so here? So this has many layers. It's not just that he's left out as a Greek hero, as a Greek god. Mm -hmm. He's left out as the nephew of King Priam, as the cousin of Hector and Paris. We think of cosmopolitanism, though, as something that's modern. Mm -hmm. But the word is Greek. It's an yes. ancient Greek word. Many words are Many Greek. Many words are Greek. The ancient writers would think, how can you leave him out? Right. And it's interesting because you can find it in the ancient texts. Oh, absolutely. And <laughs> not just in Greek. In Roman, Romans would name their children Memnon. Wow. I mean, he was a god. Yeah. He was an expert warrior. He had armor from Hephaestus. And yeah. he's so tied into the mythology of Greece. That's crazy. And completely yeah. erased uh, when you study Greek mythology, unless you look for it. Right. Unless you look for it. So another big name, Andromeda. Yes. And just to refresh, maybe you can refresh us of who Andromeda was. She is the class, the I would probably say the original princess in distress about to be eaten by a dragon. So you have Perseus. Who's just gotten the... So remember Perseus, the myth where he right. slays Medusa. Actually, if you remember Clash of the Titans exactly. from the 1980s. Exactly, that's it. And the remake. The, and the remake. Andromeda is literally the damsel in distress that Perseus is going to go save. So in Greek mythology, Andromeda is the daughter of Cepheus and Cassiopeia. And they are both the king and queen of ancient Ethiopia. So when you think of Clash of the Titans... Blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman. What color is Andromeda? <laughs> She ain't Ethiopian, let <laughs> yeah, me tell that's you that. Right. In the myth, Not even Cassio in the remake. <laughs> Cassiopeia boasts that her daughter is more beautiful than the Nereids, which pisses off Poseidon, mm -hmm. and Poseidon sends his sea monster 
and uh, says he's going to flood the coast of Ethiopia Mm -hmm. unless they give him a sacrifice, which unfortunately is poor Andromeda. Right. You know, the, the, and, and no one questions her beauty. And paintings of Andromeda over and over again paint her as white, and she's yeah. not because the ancients did not have a problem with beauty and blackness. It's interesting you bring that because you could look at King Solomon. Great and, point. And, and Sheba. And she was black. That's right. And the this, Queen this, of Ethiopia again. Yeah, the Song of Solomon. Uh-huh. And he talks about how beautiful and this black woman is. Absolutely. And... Back to our Greek Andromeda story. So in the actual Ovid text, and I'll have links to all of this. Oh my gosh, I have so many links for this episode. From the Ovid, book four, uh, let me, I'll just quote here, leaving innumerable nations behind. So this is after Perseus beheads Medusa. He's flying on his little wings that he got. Yeah. And and he happens Poor to Medusa. fly over um, as he's returning the head to save his mom, leaving innumerable nations behind, below and around him. He came in sight of the Ethiopian peoples and the fields of Cepheus. There Jupiter, Amon, had unjustly ordered the innocent Andromeda to pay the penalty for her mother, Cassiopeia's words. And in the story, he completely looks at her. She's the most beautiful thing he's ever seen. He totally falls in love with her. Wants to save (laughs) wants to save her, wants to marry her. Now, because Greeks, although blackness is not a problem, unfortunately, women have no say in anything. Yeah. Big issue uh, with the Greek mythology and the women. Big time. Doesn't ask Andromeda, should I marry her? The poor thing is gonna die. I don't think she's gonna say no. She doesn't have much choice. Tri- well, you doesn't know, look at Medusa. Choice. He's carrying Medusa's head, and well, there's a whole other story with that. But Actually, anyway. we'll we'll do a Medusa story. Yeah, Ovid in multiple references in different stories about blackness and beauty, and it's not a problem at all. No. There's there's no problem at all with where they're from or what they look like. It's you know, not by accident that African culture is erased from what we would call Western history. When money comes into the mix justifications must be brought about. Putting this back in context, it does matter because right. you're not inserting black people into white history. No. They were erased in the first place. Right. What we're doing is erasing the white that was painted over them. Yeah, it's just restoring it. It's restoring it. It's like yeah. restoring a painting. It's restoring it back to what it, it was. And there, I did come across a book that I am dying to buy now. Mm. Blacks in Antiquity, Ethiopians in the Greco-Roman Experience by Frank M. Snowden mm-hmm. for Harvard University Press. And he methodically goes through, as you would from Harvard, he apparently has over 140 illustrations depicting black people in Greek and Roman, the original artwork. And he dispels generalizations he says that they were neither romanticized nor scorned the ethiopian in classical antiquity was considered by pagan and christians without prejudice this is something that unfortunately has been lost and it was lost um, once the transatlantic slave trade started to kick up into high gear again i wouldn't say lost i'd say erased that's probably a better word because lost is an accident this is on purpose I don't know. I can purposefully lose something. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> That's ridiculous. We said that at the same time. So, so, okay. I just wanted to point out a couple that are so glaringly obvious. You know, we even look at the sky. What do we see? The Andromeda galaxy. Cassiopeia, her mother, is, is, is in the stars, the constellation. Mm-hmm. These were African women. Yeah. So just to throw in, we're trying to go through a bit of a timeline. Mm-hmm. Let's go to Acts of the Apostles. Okay. Let's and do that. In <laughs> and there is, again, Ethiopia, the conversion of the Ethiopian. Mm-hmm. And as you mentioned previously, Solomon falls in love with, with Sheba, yes, a exactly. black woman. And so in the Acts of the Apostles... Okay, 26. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying... Arise and go south to the road that dis, uh, that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. And he arose and went, and behold, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. Thus, he was an Ethiopian Jew. That's right. So this, I think, does double duty. There are many Ethiopian Jews. 
And this particular eunuch mm -hmm. was stopped by Philip, one of the apostles, mm -hmm. and the rest of from until uh, verse 40, it's Philip talking to him because the eunuch, who I don't think they mention no, his name, they don't really was mention reading the book of Isaiah. And then Philip started talking about that and ended up converting him. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ethiopians have a long history, both of being Jewish and of being Christian. Yep. So as we have mentioned, mm -hmm. they're in Greek mythology, they're in Roman mythology, uh, they're in the Bible. <laughs> yeah. Everything was normal. If Philip didn't say, oh my God, he's African. <laughs> yeah, he he did not care. Yeah, no African angels like God, that. An angel yeah. of God inspired him to go and talk yeah. to this man. Yeah, it was just a man. Just a guy. Yep. That God wanted him to convert. Right. And uh, no one said, but he's black, God. And God said, shut up and do it. Right. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is that as you start to exit from antiquity into even the medieval world. Let's go to medieval world now. Right. I went through this kick of reading a lot of King Arthur stories. Because you're crazy. And I admire you for doing it. I could not. Yeah. The, blah, um, blah, 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 smote, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, there's a lot of And smoting. he smote her and she smote. I felt like I was reading Monty Python. I just couldn't get into it. And that's probably how they came up with the Holy Grail. <laughs> <laughs> there's so much smoting going so, on. It's hard to keep reading. I was reading this one story. It was the story of Morian. His father was British. Uh, he had gone to Africa, Morocco, had fallen in love with this woman, had a kid with uh, who was Maureen, then went back to England, dies in England. Kid goes back looking for him, ends up getting in a fight with uh, this other knight who happens to be his brother, and then his half-brother, and off they go into all these different adventures, and eventually he converts. And I was just like, wait a second. Right. Because to me, King Arthur... It's Prior Whitey to, Whitesville. That's like, yeah, that's like, exactly. Whitey Whitesville. <laughs> anyway, so this led me down a really bizarre, again, it's, it's it's this rabbit hole just keeps getting deeper and deeper for me. Through reading a lot of this stuff, I came across the book called Parzival, which was published uh, back in the 1200s. Mm -hmm. Between 1200 and 1210. Mm -hmm. By a man by the name of Wolfram von Eschenbach. He was the only knight to have written an actual King Arthur story. Everyone else was basically some monk who was hauled up. So you get a lot of these overly moralistic stuff. Mm -hmm. He actually was the guy who, when you read it, you're like, yeah, that actually sounds believable. Mm -hmm. He completely blows me away even further than that uh, Morian story. And why is that? Well, the main character, Parsifal's father, Garamet falls in love with this uh, queen called Queen Bella Kane. And she's Muslim, Moorish, as they say. Yeah. She's a Moor. And he ends up leaving her. Well, first he does marry her. Yes, he does. He does knock her up. Right. And being the good Christian that he is. Because <laughs> they couldn't get along about the whole religion thing. She didn't convert. Thing. And even though he had married her, and yeah, I like the way some rules are you know, deal breakers and others are not. He went back to France because okay. he was French. Yes, Parzival was French. So someone apparently asked him and why, and he actually says this. Okay, here's the quote. Now many an ignorant fellow may think it was her black skin I ran away from, but in my eyes she was as bright as the sun. The thought of her womanly excellence afflicts me, for if noblesse were a shield, she would be its centerpiece. Ooh. So very, very interesting. There is no hiding that Bella Kane was black. He <laughs> no, fell in love with her. She's not. gorgeous. He knocks her up. Right. Leaves her, of course. But yeah. he said it's the not original because she dad. was... <laughs> but it's not because she was black. It was because she was Muslim. Right. You're talking the 12 freaking hundreds. Exactly. We're st like right now. We're still trying and he's to. German. <laughs> he's German. Yeah, he's German, right? Six percent of the Knights of the Round Table were black. Were black, yeah. or African heritage. Yes. And that's never shown. Right. At all. Now it seems like a small number, but count how many black senators <laughs> are in the U.S. right now. And if in you think West. about it back then, yes, it, yeah, exactly. as everybody always says, Lord of the Rings can't have a black elf. Absolutely. That's so <laughs> funny. You're right. They really it's do like, fuss hello. over the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And if it's based on Arthurian legend, if it's based on medieval period. Right. 
So in this quote, we're going to look at the first time that Parsifal meets Feriphaz. His brother. Yes, but he doesn't know it's his brother yet. No, he doesn't. That's the excitement. <laughs> so there's these two men. One is Christian, one is Muslim. They're evenly matched. Huge duel, epic duel. Neither gets the better of the other. So then they decide they're both brilliant. They want to find out who the other is because they always have their helmets on so you don't know who they are. Farifaz, who's on the Muslim side, describes who he is. And Parsifal says, wait a minute, those lands belong to my father. Who are you to say that you're from these lands? Parsifal says, I do have a brother. Mm -hmm. And Farifaz says, well, describe him to me. What does he look like? And so Parsifal says, it is like a parchment with writing. Black and white in patches. This is how Ekuba described him to me. And then Farifaz says, I am he. And they're constantly saying infidel, which is insulting to <laughs> yeah, totally Muslim is. people. But yes. So Parzival yeah. says, well, that's me. I'm your brother. Right. So as soon as they find out it's his brother, and again, I guess it wasn't hidden that his father had a, a child. A child And he was married woman. to her, so he wasn't an illegitimate child. Right. So they were half-brothers. And uh, so then after they took off their helmets so they could look at each other, and it says Parsifal found a treasure trove, the most precious he had ever lit on, meaning he found his brother. He was a treasure. And Farifaz was recognized immediately, for he was marked like a magpie. Mm-hmm. Farifaz and Parsifal ended their strife with a kiss. It was more fitting for them to be friends than bitter enemies. Their contest was settled by loyalty and affection. Yes. So as soon as they found out, oh my God, you're my brother... There's no question. And they do mention, you looked into this a little bit. Yeah, mosaicism. So there's, there's, you can have vitiligo, which is uh, sometimes seen as latent uh, albinism, where you start losing the pigmentation of your skin. Kind of like Michael Jackson, if you want an example. Yeah, Michael Jackson, there's plenty of people who Mm -hmm. had it. Or mosaicism, where you're born with patches. Yes, exactly. So you can read this like he was mixed, and they were describing him as being both black and white. Right, right. Or yeah, mosaicism. Um, mosaicism. But again, this didn't matter. No, uh, it was his have... brother. That's what mattered most. Exactly. It was his brother. And so when the two of them threw some battles as they went along, and they eventually went to meet Gawain, or Gawain, who was King Arthur's nephew and also a knight at the round table, when Farifaz's armor was removed when they went mm-hmm. to see Gawain, or Gawain, <laughs> they gazed at this mottled man, M-O-T-T-L-E-D, and all who liked to talk of marvels had ocular proof of one there. Farifaz's skin was strangely patterned. Make me acquainted with your companions, cousin, said Gowan to Parsifal. He looks so dazzlingly elegant, I never saw anything like it. So he saw him and thought, oh my gosh. This guy's pretty cool. This guy's awesome. <laughs> this guy's and pretty then, cool. And then so... It continues, if I am your kinsman, Parsifal answered his host, then so is he. Yes. Let Gamaret assure you of that. This is the king of Zazamank, where my father so gloriously won Belakain, who bore this knight. Gawain duly kissed the infidel. Mighty Farifiz was black and white all over his skin, and it, it didn't matter. And even the ladies welcomed them and kissed them all, and uh, yep. and apparently they Arthur t- treats them pretty good. Yes, yes, he's together. He completely. goes off, even though he is an he, infidel. I he know. goes they off say with that his so brother many times. to find the Grail. Parsifal is the only knight to find the Grail. That's right. So and if you Farifaz know you're Arthurian is like, legends, Yon, I really don't care about this. This whole Grail. Yeah, thing. he went with him to help out his bro, but he didn't care about the Holy Grail. Didn't care about it, but. At the end, when the grail is presented to Parsifal, uh, one of the grail maidens catches the eye of Farifaz. So, uh, you know, um, yeah, I'd like to be introduced to her. And everyone says, yeah, but she's Christian. And he says, well, if she is Christian, then make me Christian too as well. <laughs> so two things that has been done here. One, one is a Christian and a Muslim, no problem. On the quest for the holiest object, which is the Holy Grail. So maybe three things. The second, white and black doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. They're brothers. Right. But 
the original mm -hmm. problem mm -hmm. with his father and his mother mm -hmm. by her not wanting to convert is overcome by her son. He says, yeah, you know what? Eh, whatever. I'll switch. I really don't care. It's like he's not really all that religious. He falls in love with her. Or, love is more important. That's it. That's it. Love conquers all. Yes. And you could read it like he converted to Christianity, but you could also read it that love is above that. Yes. And this is very dangerous for Wolfram to do this back then. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because back then, you know, all these guys are writing about, no, you, you turn Christian because you saw the light. It, right, right. Whereas right. this idea of love for another person, uh -huh. a woman, uh -huh. yeah, that's not really talked about yes, very highly. That's a very good so point. that is very brave of him to pull that off. Mm -hmm. And still we have this today. But with all of these things in there, intact in that book, when you read it and someone says to you, well, you know, all the King Arthur Knights needs to be white, and nonsense. So in looking at our examples in ancient Greek history, mm -hmm. Roman history, yeah. even the medieval period, in right. the Bible. Everything's going pretty good. Everything's going good. Guess what? We're going to hit a bump on that road. But I like the good feeling. Can we I, stay here? I wish we Can could. Can we stay here in no, this nice for the No, we're not going to stay here. Unfortunately, we hit this massive roadblock called Kaboom. the Enlightenment. But we'll talk about that in part two next week. Today's fantastically terrible character or creature is the human eating tree of Madagascar. Trees in African lore are generally good things. Large trees are believed to have spirits, and if you keep them happy, they'll offer their protection. However, in Madagascar, there is a tree that catches people with its branches, opens its bark, and swallows them whole. Friends and relatives will hear the poor victim sing a goodbye song from inside their wooden prison. Goodbye, I'm stuck in the tree. <laughs> the only way to save them, or Susie in this case, <laughs> is to pay a woodpecker to use his magic powers and sharp bill to crack an opening in the tree to release the victim. Thank you, woodpecker. <laughs> No problem. <laughs> That's all, folks. Seven Robots Fantastically Terrible Podcast is by Miguel Guerra and Susie Diaz. Our theme song is by Susie. The best way to support our podcast is to leave a review on iTunes. This helps others to find us and we can see your name and personally thank you live on the show. For more information on this episode, including links to everything we've mentioned, and there was a lot, please visit our website at www.7robots.com slash podcast. Another fun way to support us is to read our free comics on Webtoon. Ghost Metal is a series of 100 original horror sci-fi stories that you should definitely read with the lights on. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time.